It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Mickey Huff has been on the front lines of the fight for truth and free speech for many years. He is a tireless advocate for our right to know, and with his co-conspirator and fellow professor Peter Phillips, he declared a truth emergency in 2008 that roiled the Media Reform Conference that I attended with them in Minneapolis. The self-styled progressive leaders of free press tried to censor Huff and Phillips for telling the truth because Fox News had cameras in the hall and free press was more interested in good press than free speech. Mickey Huff is a husband, a dad, a talented guitarist who favors speed metal, death metal, thrash metal, and doom metal, among other precious metals. He's professor of social science and history at Diablo Valley College, where he co-chairs the history department. He's the director of Project Censored at Sonoma State and has just completed work on his 11th annual volume, Censored 2019, which is available in the lobby. Oh, I blew it. 2020. I'm off by a year. So, stand corrected. Thank you. He's also co-host of the Project Censored radio show on KPFA and 40 other stations. You can get the podcast at projectcensored.org. I often rely on Mickey for critical thinking and credible criticism of the mainstream media. It's an important set of skills sorely needed these days. An example, after the wine country fires of 2017, he guessed it on my podcast to debunk hysterical pseudoscientific theories on the cause of the fires. From directed energy weapons to unrelated arson reports and even the Islamic State. Those of us here know the true suspect and now <laughs> the accused, the rogue utility known as PG&E. I also just picked up his new book, also available in the lobby, which he co-authored with Nolan Higdon. And that's what he's going to talk to us about tonight. It's called United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America, and What We Can Do About It. Please welcome the guy with the best hair in alternative media, Professor Mickey Huff. Thanks, man. Much appreciated. You. you bet. Go. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. I hope you're all doing, doing well on this historic, historic occasion. Uh, yet another, yet another memorial for the events of 9/11. Special thanks to Peter B. Collins and certainly uh, Carol and Ken and everyone involved in putting on the festival. Of course, thank you to the great Alan Michan for lending us this great public house. Round of applause for for that, please. So I've been here every year for a long time and have uh, had 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes. And tonight, uh, I don't know what happened, but apparently they thought I could talk for an hour. <laughs> right. Uh, brevity is certainly not one of my strong points. But I'm, I'm here tonight to talk about something uh, that actually isn't directly related to 9-11. And so I'm, you know, you got to see a lot of fantastic films, some other people talking. Um, you got to see some, you know, historiographic argumentation about the Pentagon with Ken Jenkins and the importance of understanding cognitive biases, implicit bias, the significance of critical thinking. Um, I'm actually going to be riffing a lot more on those themes this evening. Um, so I wanted to start. Uh, I wanted to start by reading a poem. from the great Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who this year just turned 100 years old. Round of applause, thank you, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and City Lights Books. And of course, our, our new book, with, with, co-authored with Nolan Higdon, United States of Distraction, Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America, and What We Can Do About It, right? It's not just we're doomed, but what are we, what are we doing about this situation? Um, we had a stellar forward by Ralph Nader. It's an honor to know Ralph and 
Again, another towering figure in the 20th century, 21st century. Big round of applause for, for the work that Ralph has done for the public sphere and for our civil rights. And we live in capitalism, so consumer rights. Um, even if we don't like capitalism, um, it's important to have someone like Ralph out there at 85. I was just on his show this week. I'm going to read this poem by Lawrence Fairling Getty. He wrote this in 2007. Some of you may know it. Um, it seems as though, again, it could have been written yesterday, and it may even be more apt. Pity the nation. Pity the nations whose people are sheep and whose shepherds mislead them. Pity the nation whose leaders are liars, whose sages are silenced, and whose bigots haunt the airwaves. Pity the nation that raises not its voice except to praise conquerors and acclaim the bully as hero and aims to rule the world with force and by torture. Pity the nation that knows no other language but its own and no other culture but its own. Pity the nations whose breath is money and sleeps the sleep of the too well fed. Pity the nation, oh pity the people who allow their rights to erode and their freedoms to be washed away. My country, tears of the sweet land of liberty. And that is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I'm going to continue with another important and significant quote, I think, that's very apt for the book and our talk here. And again, it's another, it's an epigraph that's the very beginning of our book, also by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Our government is a bird with two right wings. They're devoted to the perpetuation and spread of corporate capitalism. And it is those policies that have wrought great destruction. It is that ideology that is currently burning our world, literally. I give great thanks to my mentor and friend, Peter Phillips, who keynoted this event last year with his book, Giants, the Global Power Elites, which we also have out on our table. Big round of applause for my good friend, Peter, for the work he does. You see, Peter has helped us not only understand how corporate media lie, deceive, and censor, but he's also helped us understand who are their owners, their backers, who are their puppet masters. And if we don't understand that and follow the money, we um, don't really get to the root of the problem. And in order to uh, be a radical, if we fancy ourselves as radicals, free radicals, we have to get to the root. Radical means getting to the root and coming from the root. And a lot of uh, that has influenced my thinking and teaching. I teach critical reasoning, critical thinking, uh, social science and history, contemporary historiography. I still teach a class on 9-11 historiography as part of a critical thinking course every semester at Diablo Valley College. But I also teach on propaganda and persuasion. And I teach about social media propaganda. And Again, underneath all of this, girding all of this, is, my, is a critical pedagogy that focuses on critical media literacy and social justice. And it's really been my conclusion in the last several years. Conclusions are always temporary because I hope we're always evolving. Um, but my latest temporary conclusion really has been resting on, on that cornerstone of critical pedagogy, critical media literacy, and social justice studies. And I want to specifically look through United States of Distraction, or as Bob McChesney, the great media scholar, says that this is among the best introductions to the nature of Trump era journalism and how post truth media world is inimical to democratic society. And it's, it's interesting uh, because that's really what Nolan and I were doing in his book. That's what we were trying to do. We weren't trying to write a tome. We weren't trying to write the most scholarly book, uh, although it's scholarly. Uh, we weren't trying to write a book that preached to people. We wanted to write a book that people could understand, that wouldn't leave people frustrated, and that would actually teach 
not just teach about topics, but also model how we can be constructively critical and how we can build something better than what we have. And it's, um, it's our humble and small contribution to that large body of literature with so many wonderful people that do this kind of work. And I wanted to, to, to uh, I wanted to start by going back. I'm an historian by trade, so you're going to see a lot of back and forth. Hopefully you won't get whiplash or get dizzy. Um, but again, so much of this, of course, you all know so much about the events of 9-11. You don't need me to sit here and count down the list and poke the holes and all that business. But while I am talking about all the things that I'm going to be talking about here and making some historical trips down memory hole lane, um, of course, you'll be thinking about 9-11, and you'll be thinking about various things where this relates. Nicholas Johnson was a great FCC chairperson. Still with us, Nick Johnson. Big round of applause for another person in their, easily into their 80s. Nick Johnson wrote, I think, one of the most important communications books for uh, democratic culture that gets just widely ignored or overlooked or people have not heard of it. How many people in here, um, by a show of applause, I wish I could see you better, but the light is a bit, <laughs> a bit blinding. Um, but just show by uh, applause, how many people here have ever heard of or read Nick Johnson's book, Your Second Priority? A few of you, thank, thank you. Nick Johnson said, oh, by the way, I have great thanks to give people like Ralph Nader, and Bob McChesney, and Noam Chomsky, uh, not just, uh, you know, for what they, they have, you know, have done you know, societally, and we don't have to agree with everything that these people have ever done or said to acknowledge their, contra their didactic contributions to society. Most of the stuff that I talk about and teach in my classes, I never learned in school. I'm a professor. I have a graduate degree. I didn't learn this stuff in school. So... When I figured out that I wanted to be a professor, a teacher, I was always a music, was a music teacher since I was 16. But when I really wanted to get into this, I learned from a lot of these people, and then I learned about so many other people that I never would have found out about, maybe just because of when I was born, or because of the trajectory of my study, or because these people are not widely lauded in the academy, to be frank, which is another way that institutions become propagandistic, doctrinaire or indoctrinating all under guise of being enlightening and that is a big part of that propaganda uh, that's a big part of that propaganda and that message Nick Johnson said paraphrasing whatever your first area of interest whatever your primary concern in society whatever it is that you really think needs to be addressed and you need to go after and you need to tackle it and fix it or make it better or contribute to it that's great but if your second priority isn't reforming and making more democratic and open than media and the so-called free press, you are likely to gain very little ground in your primary area of interest. Like the 9-11 movement. It's not that there aren't learned people arguing wisely or debunking official narrative charades. It's that most people never get to hear them and they're not given the opportunity to think critically about these key core issues. So Johnson reminds us about our second priority. And that leads me, of course, to where we are right now, right? And specifically, why did we call our book The United States of Distraction? Well, look at the subtitle, Media Manipulation in Post-Truth America. United States of Distraction. Are we there yet? <laughs> I realize that my talk is not 280 characters on Twitter. I apologize. I apologize to the corporate media because they won't be here to pick it up, therefore. They won't be here to be led around by the nose by a narcissistic celebrity con man who occupies the Oval Office and rules by dictates on Twitter that they mindlessly follow and repeat and dissect and analyze over 
and over and over until the next one. And then the cycle repeats. This has dominated the major media news cycles for the last several years. So that leads me, this is going to begin our, our, some of our time travel. How did we get here? Were we always this distracted? Were we, were we always living in such noise? Did we always have such depleted trust in public institutions and the press? Well, some may argue to varying degrees. But over the last 50 years, there's been a staggering and consistent decline in that trust, some of it quite deserved. But without being cynical, it's simply unacceptable that we sit here in this United States of distraction. How did we get here? Well, Lao Tzu once wrote, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading. I ask you again, are we there yet? Sorry, it's a terrible thing to say, but bring it on, Donald. Keep going. It may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS, exclaimed Les Moonves while he was executive chairman and CEO of CBS during a Morgan Stanley Technology Media and Technology Conference in the summer of 2016. He further noted, I've never seen anything like this, and this is going to be a very good year for us. That's a small U.S., not capital U, period, S, period, as in us, we, the people. That's we, the shareholders, and the plutocracy. Moonves, of course, was referring to the ratings boostings and revenues that his network reaped from its coverage of Trump's sensationalist campaign. CBS and the other networks were punch drunk with profits gained by the way of electoral contest had devolved into a circus, a sheer spectacle. We'll come back to that. In fact, if you want to look at some of the, the dismal statistics, the Clinton campaign in particular, Trump's campaign captured nearly 300% more coverage than Clinton, 23 times more coverage than Sanders. Of course, way more than the th third party candidates. They don't even exist in the corporate press except the lampoon. Of course, Team Trump asked in the equivalent of $2 billion in free media exposure and the broadcast corporations made money hand over fist. Moonves continued, man, who would have expected the ride we're all having right now? The money is rolling in, and this is fun. Are we all having a good time? This is by design. This is not accidental. This is not because we're too stupid and ignorant. It may be because we sometimes lack agency. It may be because we have been pushed, fouled, and winnowed into our hyper-partisan media silos that have encouraged our confirmation bias. The technological changes that have moved us far away from social gatherings and community meetings. Even our activism is through screens and mediated and manipulated by algorithms and bots that we never see and we see even less than our neighbors. <laughs> Where did fake news come from? This whole moniker of fake news in this United States of distraction. Well, it's the product of confirmation bias. It's the product of propaganda. It's the product of people like Les Moonves that have completely sold out any journalistic principles for profit, no matter what the consequences have been for our public sphere. Whether it's education, free press, and lack thereof, whether it's literally our campaigns that are controlled by PR firms and major corporations, not us. This, indeed, 
was foist upon us in any ways. I'm not saying we're innocent as a society. We have agency that we aren't using. And that's a big part of what this book is about. In fact, the last chapter is titled, Make America Think Again. This assumes we were ever very thoughtful. <laughs> but I would submit that we are surely capable of critical thought and analysis. And everybody in this room clearly exhibits that around various topics. In other words, we're completely able to. And when I teach critical thinking courses, one of the things I do is I look around the room, and of course this is after a week of you know, people hearing me rant and rave about various esoteric untold histories, and they're trying to figure out if, I'm, you know, if they're in the right place, or if I should be locked up. Um, and I say, I said, you know, you all think critically, or else you wouldn't be here. Not just because you're in college, you'd be dead. <laughs> you make critical choices every day in all parts of your life. Particularly about things you're interested in. And the reminder here is, let's just pick one thing out of a hat. Um, people are interested in things like professional sports. Great. Um, Sports might be interesting, certainly people that play them or have athletic prowess or have an athletic intelligence, it's wonderful and it's a wonderful expression. The total corporate commercialization of it, of course, is another crass manifestation that has led us to be a, a vicarious people that live through spectacle, which is very problematic. Um, but I look out in the classrooms and I see people with their jerseys and their hats and their things and I say, hey, I'll bet you can sit down, you know, you're at the bar, five drinks in, arguing with your buddies about uh, esoteric statistics about how when so-and-so's on the mound and so-and-so's at bat and they're batting against a right-handed pitcher and it's Tuesday on a full moon, they have a 36% chance of hitting the ball between this and that and so forth. And they just rattle off details and rattle off statistics. Some of it, even if it's baseball or football, you get into like trajectory, physics, all kind of things. People are like really into this. And I say, that's great. So you can think. <laughs> Now how about thinking critically about something that actually matters? These kind of things matter for distraction. They matter maybe because we're, there are guilty pleasures. Maybe they're things we enjoy. Maybe we like even doing them. Much better than watching, but doing them. Great. But I can tell you that the outcome of the game is going to have very little effect on your life. Unless, of course, you're you know, betting on it or something of this nature. I don't know. <laughs> even the losing teams in professional sports are making millions of dollars. So there you go. If you want to change some of that dynamic and mix it up, have the losing team have to give all their salaries, um, not just to the other team, but to all the homeless people in the other team's city. That'll change the game. Meanwhile, back to critical thinking. It doesn't matter what happens in the big game, but it does matter what happens in our political culture. And you might not care about politics, but politics cares about you. And so taking a, a part of that critical analytical side of our brains, applying it to something that actually matters and makes a difference is key and crucial, and we can all do it. I know I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak, because here you all are on the 18th Memorial of the events of 9-11, still thinking critically, still asking questions, still pushing, still working to lift that veil, which is also ultimately rooted in, in seeking justice for victims and those affected. And those victims weren't just in New York, in Pennsylvania, in Washington, D.C. They're in countries all over the world. We've got 800 plus military bases in over 130 countries all spurred even further by the so-called war of terror. It is of terror, right? Not on terror. So we, I believe, owe it societally, not just to people in our own society, but around the world, given the stature and the wealth and the power of the United States, we owe it to keep asking the tough questions and demanding that we not only think critically with each other, but we also demand it of the people who claim to be our leaders.
which we could call misleaders. So this spectacle, right, that we are in, we've been helped out, we've been helped along. We didn't just get here on our own. And some of you may remember Carl Sagan wrote a book in 1995 called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Anybody know that book? A couple. Quote, I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy. When nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries. When awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. When the people have lost the ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority. Our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true. We slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness. Indeed, this is what Oxford Dictionary called the post-truth world. A dystopian postmodern world where feelings trump thought, where experiences trump empirical evidence and data, and where opinions, however unfounded, somehow are equal to the lifetime of one's knowledge. Sagan continues, the dumbing down of America is most evident in the slow decay of substantive content in the enormously influential media. The 30 second sound bites, now down to 10 seconds or less. Lowest common denominator programming. Credulous presentations on pseudoscience and superstition. But especially a kind of celebration of ignorance. My tagline for the night. Are we there yet? Pretty close. I'm not sure how much closer I want to get. Well, again, we got here. We got here by design. And historically, let's take a little bit of a look at some of how we have gotten here by design. We have some folks that are going to help us. Um, and this is, this writer is, uh, I'd say, unfortunately become far, far too relevant. That would be Hannah Arendt, who wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism back in 1951. In an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing. Think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. Mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd. It did not particularly object to being deceived because it held every statement to be a lie anyhow. 1951. The totalitarian mass leaders based their propaganda on the correct psychological assumption that under such conditions one could make people believe the most fantastic statements one day and trust that if the next day they were given irrefutable proof of their falsehood, they would take refuge in cynicism instead of deserting the leaders who had lied to them. They would protest that they had known all along that the statement was a lie and would admire the leaders for their superior tactical cleverness. Weapons of mass destruction. Exhibit A. Maybe that's Exhibit B, and we can go back a minute and have another Exhibit A called The Events of 9-11 and the Official Narrative that Continues to Buttress Those Falsehoods to This Day. Arendt was on to something, and a lot of the people that we are going to go and tip our hat to here, some of them, some of them had nefarious, insidious intent to manipulate and deceive and control and then rationalize it. People like Edward Bernays, who we'll talk about in a second. Others tried to warn us, warts and all, imperfectly perhaps, 
But when George Orwell wrote 1984, he didn't mean for it to be a user's manual. And this is something that, again, we can, we can learn from these, these folks. And so, you know, there's another person in here, since we're hopscotching around, and I'm going to go back and, and talk about Bernays, uh, because I think that it's, he's going to help us punctuate some of this. Uh, but before I do that, before I get into Bernays, Eddie Bernays, who was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, who in 1928 wrote a book called Propaganda, which was a blueprint for how to control and manipulate information. And in fact, it justified why the leaders of a particular society, the elites in the establishment, not only had every right to do that to the public because they were a bewildered herd in need of being led by their estimation, but that public quote unquote servants had an obligation to use propaganda to control modern democratic states. But others, and inc this includes, of course, the uh, historian um, Daniel Borston. How many people here remember the, history, um, the great historian Daniel Borston? Anybody? A couple people? Well, there's, lots of, there's lots of reading that you all can get going on. <laughs> um, turn off YouTube for a minute. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe check, check out some, some of these other folks and, and what they have going on, because these are people that have, you know, lived, lived long before us. And they, they were, some, some of them, I would say, were strikingly prescient. Strikingly. And one of them was the historian Daniel Borston. And the reason that I'm mentioning Borston right now, and I have a... Wednesday, Wednesday evening class that I forgot to give a big shout out to. That's my persuasion media and propaganda class at Cal State East Bay. Some of them may be, may be here. Um, I couldn't be there this evening because I was invited to talk to you all uh, about basically what I'm teaching in that class anyway. <laughs> um, and one of the books they're reading is Propaganda by Eddie Bernays. Another one of the books they're reading is The Image, A Guide to Pseudo-Events in America. It was written in 1962. I highly recommend that you give, give it a read, even a cursory review. It's rare for historians to come out of the bubble of the academy in the so-called ivory tower. I, I'm not at an ivory tower. I'm at a state school and a community college at DVC and old brick buildings that look like fallout shelters. Well, I guess we're in luck because Russia, Russiagate has brought us the, the new Cold War, so I'll be, maybe I'll be safe. Borston argued, he describes this world in 1962. He says, I describe the world of our making. Just think about it, it's 1962. Just like it was a rent in 1951. Sagan in 1995, dot, 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 are we there yet? Borston describes the world of our making, how we've used our wealth, our literacy, our technology, and our progress to create a thicket of unreality which stands between us and the facts of life. I recount historical forces which have given us this unprecedented opportunity to, to deceive ourselves and to befog our own experience. Of course, America has provided the landscape and has given us the resources and the opportunity for this feat of national self-hypnosis. But each of us individually provides the market and the demand for the illusions with, which flood our experience. We want and we believe these illusions because we suffer from extravagant expectations. We expect too much of the world. Our expectations are extravagant in precisely the dictionary sense of the world, quote, going beyond the limits of reason or moderation. They are excessive. When we pick up our newspaper at breakfast, we expect, we even demand that it bring us momentous events since the night before. We turn on the car radio as we drive to work and expect news to have occurred since the morning newspaper went to press. Returning in the evening, we expect our house not only to shelter us, to keep us warm in the winter and cool in the summer, but to relax us, to dignify us, to encompass us with soft music and interesting hobbies, to be a playground, a theater, and a bar. 
my favorite part. We expect, right? We expect these kinds of things. And many of them are very, very contradictory. We expect anything and everything. We expect the contradictory and the impossible. We expect compact cars which are spacious, luxurious cars which are economical. We expect to be rich and charitable, powerful and merciful, active and reflective, kind and competitive. Is your head spinning yet? We expect to be inspired by mediocre appeals for excellence. To be made literate by illiterate appeals for literacy. We expect to eat and stay thin, to be constantly on the move and ever more neighborly, to go to a church of our choice and yet feel its guiding power over us and revere God, to revere God and to be God. Never have people been more the masters of their environment, yet never has a people felt more deceived and disappointed. For never has a people expected so much more than the world could offer. By harboring, nourishing, and ever enlarging our extravagant expectations, we create the demand for the illusions with which we deceive ourselves and which we pay others to make to deceive us. This story of the making of our illusions, it's the news behind the news, may be the most appealing news of the world. This is Borston's cry to call out the fake news of his day. He didn't call it fake news. He called it pseudo-events. He called it the image. And we could riff on uh, the allegory of the cave in Plato. How we are distracted and manipulated by the flickering shadows on the cave wall that are the internet now or that were the television in the 1960s. Another FCC giant, not a telecom pawn and tool like Ajit Pai, who wants to kill net neutrality and, and capture the commons of our communication systems that the 1934 Telecommunications Act said were ours, not six corporations that control 90% of the news we see and hear from the television and now internet. But Newton Minow on the FCC called television a vast wasteland. This is in the 60s. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's a reason why I keep bouncing around historically and I'm going back and I'm kind of pulling out some of these prescient, wise, sage-like creatures. They warned us. They tried to teach us. We didn't listen. And for some of us, we just couldn't hear it through the noise. Critical thinking, critical pedagogy, critical media literacy helps tune out the noise. And we're all capable of it. Whether we want to tune out the noise that's crowding out our understanding of that exciting sporting event, or if we might actually want to apply it to somewhere where it matters in our real lives. Those are choices. We're inundated with choices. That's part of our extravagant expectation. But you do notice, I know you do, that the same public relations firms that sell us a hundred different kinds of toothpaste are the same ones that sell us two candidates for public office. It's by design. <laughs> by the way, consumer culture itself is one of the biggest distractions that we are drowning in every day. So if you don't have a critical pedagogy, if you don't have good critical thinking skills, if you're not an independent thinker, Remember, the anarchist feminist Emma Goldman once wrote, the most unpardonable sin in society is independence of thought. 
He was deported for that. Round of applause for Emma Goldman. And Eugene Debs, another socialist who went to jail for telling the truth about the masters of war in the munitions industry, lying through their teeth with propaganda, with help of people like Edward Bernays, who sold the First World War through the Creel Commission, the Committee on Public Information, in 1916, after Woodrow Wilson won re-election as a peace candidate. His campaign was waged by saying he kept us out of war. Well, that was true in 1916. <laughs> uh, but after that, the slogan was, he's going to get us into it come hell or high water. Come propaganda. Come deception. And once you can drag some of the people along through fear and intimidation, you can then start packing along from the top-down authoritarian statutes, like forced conscription, like the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act. And that's what Eugene Debs went to prison under, the Sedition Act. He was thrown in prison and sentenced to 10 years in jail for giving a speech outside of a factory in Canton, Ohio, where he was asking the people who were workers who were going by, who were getting interested in going to this war. And he said, is it the Germans that have kept you down in the factory? Is it the Germans who are starving your family? Or is it the owner of the means of production at this plant? For speaking that truth, Debs went to prison in the land of the free. That was a hundred years ago. And now Julian Assange rots in prison. Chelsea Manning rots in prison. This is an abomination. And you know why people are going along with it? For the same reason they went along with it in 1917. Propaganda. Deception. And now the ever-clever weaponization of it. It's now meta and post-truth. Because as Trump masterfully did. He took the phrase fake news right from the mouths of the DNC, the Democrats, and the Washington Post. And he flipped around. He said, hey, you say Russia's spreading uh, spread fake news around the country. When you take a look at the data, the amount of it was absolutely insignificant. Compared to the billions of dollars of money that the corporate media was both giving and making, by covering Trump and Clinton in the most sensationalist, trivial way possible. They even may have coupled after the election and said that they were collectively sorry that they also totally blew it. From the Washington Post and the New York Times to CNN, they all said, wow, what just happened? Hangover. What happened? You know, the Washington Post even got really interesting. Um, Margaret Sullivan, who was the media critic there, then said, it's time to retire the words fake news. And of course, at the time, this was November of 2016, I said, you know, I, how about we retire the practice? Starting with the Washington Post. <laughs> A CIA rag going back to the 50s that was one of the great mockingbird platforms for the Muddy Wurlitzer of the CIA manipulation and media, uh, uh, media propaganda program. That was a thing. It is a thing. It is a thing. Trump took that phrase, fake news, and he flipped it around on anybody with whom he disagreed. And he said, you're fake news. Jim Acosta at CNN, you're fake news. You don't get a question. I mean, again, these are the actions of a petulant man-child. Yeah, he is. He's full of it from top to bottom. Not that Obama wasn't. But Obama was a much more skillful liar, wasn't he? 
That should tell you something about where we are with a free, so-called free press. Right? The Post, warts and all, has cataloged somewhere in the neighborhood of 12,000 false statements that Trump has made since taking office. He does it with impunity. It's like a running joke. And we're the butt of it. We're the butt of it. And I, by the way, I criticized Obama every day he was there. And before that, Bush. Before that, Clinton. And before that, a daddy Bush. And before that, Reagan. And before that, when I was eight, nine years old, I started wondering what the hell Jimmy Carter was doing and why the Shah of Iran was being kicked out and what the hell was going on with the Ayatollah Khomeini and who were these people. I wasn't even 10. Because my dad had Life magazine in the house and my parents read. They weren't college educated. They were working class. And they taught me to question everything. And I still do to this day. Including the stuff that goes on in the lobby and the stuff that goes on in this movement. You have to think critically about all of it. The minute you think you know is the minute you start to slip. We are in the throes of an epistemological crisis, literally. Epistemological crisis. Epistemology is the philosophy and study of how we know what we know. And post-truth is the epitome of the crisis. Andy Roth and I at Project Censor don't believe in post-truth. It's another propaganda campaign. One loving people into the soft blanket of confirmation bias that makes us sleep well at night because we think we know. Scratch that. We believe we think we know we're right. Critical thinking is never done. And when we go back and take a look in the, in the, in the 20th century with people like Eddie Bernays, Eddie Bernays didn't split hairs. Eddie Bernays came straight out and he said, here is what we're going to do. The first chapter in his book of propaganda is titled Organizing Chaos. Think about that. He wrote that the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. He did not say secret government. He didn't say deep state. CIA wasn't around yet, but there were forerunners to it. He was talking about this. We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men, and they were, we have never heard of Roger Stone, until more recently, classic example. How about John Rendon? Anybody in here know John Rendon and the Rendon Group? Clap, clap. John Rendon, anybody? Anybody. He's the man that sold the war in Iraq and WMDs and was a democratic strategist. Get that, bipartisan propaganda for war. Who would have thunk? Both these parties have been lying us into wars forever. And they need to be ritually called out and their propagandists exposed. I wish there was more clapping for that one. We're governed, our minds molded, tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is the logical result of the way in which our Democrat society is organized, Ariel quotes. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smooth functioning society, says Bernays. Notice how he's lulling us in to this sense of security. He's lulling us in. Our invisible governors are, in many cases, unaware of the identity of the fellow members of their inner cabinet. Huh. So they may not even know what each other are technically doing putting together pieces of a narrative to befog and befuddle the population at large. They govern us by their qualities of natural leadership, says Bernays. 
their ability to supply needed ideas by their key positions in the social structure. Thank you, Rachel Maddow. Thank you, PhD, Russia Gator, for helping me not think about what's going on around us, and you've been distracting us with this nonsense for almost three years plus. Putin and the oligarchs are just as rotten as any of the other oligarchs. We have ours, too. What are we doing about them? Last I checked, we didn't vote for Putin. Whatever attitude one chooses towards this condition, it remains a fact that in almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct, our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires, which control the public mind, who harness old social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. Eddie Bernays, right out in the open, 1928. This is why, again, history has much to teach us. If only we would listen. If only we could hear it through the noise. Well, like I said, we didn't just get here. This didn't just happen overnight. Not only did we see a mass privatization and corporate capture of the public sphere in terms of what's happening in the news media. We've also seen it in education. We've seen it in almost every facet of our lives, in fact. This privatizing, corporatist, top-down, fascist culture that claims to promote individual liberty, which is impossible to achieve if we don't have the larger cultural protections and values that are spread across the society equally, particularly things like the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. These are crucial, yet we hear very little about their significance. In fact, in a number of surveys number a few years ago, Rick Schinkman from uh, a historian who wrote a book called Just How Stupid Are We Facing the Truth About the American Voter 10 years ago. He, and he didn't mean it that way. He, he, that, that was just a publisher thought it was a sexy title. People bought, get the book. I'll show you. I'm not stupid. I'll read the first page of this. Um, I'll read the back cover. What he was saying is that we're, we're just not thinking critically. We're not thinking enough, deeply enough. And we, th we, we try to do things too quickly and too many things at once. And multitasking, uh, part, you know, world that we live in is not the multitasking brains that we've evolved. We, 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 don't, they, we can't do that very well. No matter how good we think we can do it, we can't do it well enough. And again, it's, uh, it's, it's Shankman who, who's reminding us, right, in this survey by saying... 25% of people in the United States could name five fictitious members of the, the Simpsons family, the television sitcom. Bart and Lisa and Maggie and you know, Homer and Marge and some of the pets and other characters, people whipping them out. One in a thousand could name all five freedoms protected under the First Amendment. Only one in a thousand. It's hard to protect something you don't know you have to protect. Right now, we're right back to the United States of distraction. It's not that we can't pay attention. It's that we often pay attention to the wrong things. Well, this whole process of privatization, and we talk about this at length in the book, we go back to James Buchanan, prototype of the economic neocons that are born through Milton Friedman, that are later manifest in campaigns and administrations like Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew, who, by the way, kind of wrote the book on the enemy of the people by castigating the press, right? I mean, nothing Trump has done has been original at all, including weaponizing fake news, right? Trump is just a master showman. He is a 14-season, quote, reality TV star who knows how to fire people, he certainly is not somebody that encourages any kind of critical discourse. And the news media that covers his every 280 dictate through Twitter gets led around by the nose, like I told you earlier. CNN, for example, put no fewer than 10 people 
talking about one of his tweets for literally three hours. I'm not making this up. You, if you watch any of this stuff, your mind will go numb with it. I mean, that's what's part of the problem with this. People are like, you guys got too many examples in here. I'm like, don't blame me. I didn't make them. I'm just noticing some. And by the way, this is just some. But the media gets led around by the nose. And then they say, will he tweet back? What will he say? This is the most egregiously idiotic thing we've ever heard. And it's dividing the country. And we're going to keep talking about it. I guess we'll keep dividing people even more, therefore. The corporate media got sucked right into their own narrative. Their own fake news narrative. Right? And this is a big problem. is because... Even though we write books about propaganda and media censorship, we're not doing it in the same way. <laughs> we're constructively criticizing what could be done better in media. The Washington Post and New York Times sometimes write riveting stories that change the course of policy and history because some people there can do it. Just like how we can think critically when we want to. We don't all the time, particularly when it seems to matter most. So we shake our fist at the corporate media, in many cases, for doing some of the same things that we do every day. That's why, warts and all, we do have to support free press. We do have to stand up when these people are being called, as Agnew would call them, the nattering nabobs of negativism. William Sapphire wrote that. Credit due. Right. Agnew didn't write that. Just like Trump doesn't write his. And as I've submitted to many, I don't know this yet, but maybe we'll find out. I don't think Trump is even the person that's behind Twitter. I think there could easily be a room full of people. What are we going to say next, boss? What are we going to say? How do we keep them distracted next? Because that has worked absolutely to the T. That kind of distraction that the so-called press can't even get and cover this and so guess what the free press has been doing it's so-called the corporate media has glommed on to fake news too and they said oh yeah well we're gonna fight fake news and then they're gonna fight it online with algorithms and bots and laser fishing and they're gonna they're gonna tell us what real news is organizations like prop or not or how about this for an or Orwellian masterpiece that you couldn't make up if you tried? An organization called New Knowledge. That is one of three companies that is a supplier of information and consults with the Senate Intelligence Committee. Deresta, a woman named um, Renee Deresta, is the research director at New Knowledge. And she's actually said that we are living in what she calls an information war. And the human mind is the territory, she writes. If you aren't a combatant, you are the territory. Well, don't be surprised, but it's also new knowledge that was spoon-feeding the Senate Intelligence Committee a bunch of bogus information about Russian interference in the election. And the CEO of new knowledge, Jonathan Morgan, actually got caught trying to manipulate the Alabama special Senate election with Republican Roy Moore by making it look like Russian bots were manipulating the election to support him. And then he got caught doing it, and the New York Times even called it a false flag. Just wrap your head around that. And yet, new knowledge still works with Congress and the Intel Committee and the Senate. You, you, you can't even make this stuff up. The resta is like the Bernays of our time as is new knowledge. These are the propagandists. These are the people pulling the wires of the public mind, but they're doing it with algorithms and bots and social media. Don't fall for it. Don't be duped. Don't be duped. <laughs> Five ways to flex your critical media literacy muscles. Cut out the junk food news from your media diet. Turn it off. Turn off the corporate media. Follow the money. Always follow the money in a capitalist system. Why does someone want me to know this? Ask who is treated as newsworthy. Who's a newsmaker? Who's a news shaper? Who isn't? Resist news inflation. CN talks for three hours about a tweet. That's not news. 
You know, in three hours, they could probably read halfway through this book on air. And seek out and support solutions journalism and constructive media literacy and independent alternative news outlets. They all have issues. They all have problems. But start building relationships with ones that actually do critical thought, critical analysis, and tra have transparently sourced facts. And remember that broken clocks are right twice a day. Don't just ignore, I'm not going to read the New York Times, they're a bunch of propaganda. Sure they are. But they also do report some news. We, also, we have to be able to discern that for ourselves. We're the ones that should be making that determination. Not prop or not. Not new knowledge. Not these kinds of shadowy organizations. News guard. We have a whole chapter on them in our 2020 censored book. News guard. Yeah, so Fox News got a, like, like a green light rating. CNN got a green light rating. Mint Press News, red light. People like Abby Martin, red. I mean, this is absolutely riveting. We should also support the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. They have one. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Seek truth and report it. Minimize harm. Act independently. And be accountable and transparent. That's a good start. And a place that will end. Carl Jensen, the founder of Project Censored in 1995, same year as Sagan, wrote that quote. Carl Jensen didn't want to accept a cynical, solutionless, dystopic future. And right as he was exiting Project Censored to hand the reins over to Peter Phillips, he wrote this. He said, and now I'm also channeling our buddy Nick Johnson, second priority. Since we'll all benefit from a more responsible media, meaning we the people, we should really help bring it about. To do this, the corporate media owners should start to earn their unique First Amendment privileges. Editors should rethink their news judgment, or maybe think about it a first time. Twitter. Jeez. Journalists should persevere in going after the hard stories, you know, like the ones that aren't coming at you from Twitter. Journalism professors should emphasize ethics and critical analysis and turn out more muckrakers and fewer buckrakers. The judicial system should defend the freedom of the press provision of the First Amendment with far more vigor, and the public should show the media it is more concerned with the high crimes and misdemeanors of its political and corporate leaders than it is with the crimes and gossip of celebrities. The effort will be well worth it. And nearly 25 years later, here I am, 11 censored books in. I say... We can do this. We can do it together. We can even do it civilly. And we can accept that we have disagreements. But we have to keep the eyes on the prize. And the way we get there is with a vigilant and open and transparent free press. Thank you, as always. It's an honor to be here with all of you. If you'd like to come by the table and have a friendly argument, I never turn one down. I love to hear feedback, including criticism. We have books, we have stuff and things to share, and if I can ever do anything for you or be of any help to things that you do in your communities, don't hesitate to contact me through projectcensored.org. Thank you all for the great work that you do.